Okay, great. Thank you. Next up, we have John Morseman from Columbia Biosciences, and the talk title is New Fluorophores for Spectral Cytometry and Custom Labeling. Hi, Christina. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me to give a talk today. And, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit today about some new fluorophores that we've developed for spectral cytometry and some future fluorophores that we're developing for uh, cytometry as well. And I want to start with a little background on Columbia Biosciences, and we're probably the company you haven't heard of that we supply a lot of fluorescent dyes to the manufacturers of the conjugates you use in flow cytometry. So I'll talk a little bit about Columbia, give a little bit of background on, on some of the fluorophores we develop, how they're used in nature, I tie it back into cytometry with, with some of the new uh, probes we have, and then talk about some probes we have in the future. And then I'll touch on, on a little bit of our custom labeling service for getting antibodies labeled. So Columbia Biosciences, we were founded in 2007. It's a company I helped uh, found with a number of other people. We were a microalgal uh, biotechnology firm at Martech Biosciences. Um, we developed some of the first omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, we also developed a lot of the early fluorescent dyes used in flow cytometry. Uh, and they're still used today. So we're basically, the, the company is an interesting company because it really combines, you know, all the life sciences. So, you know, physics and biology and chemistry, and you're working on the physics of light, you know, the physics of light and energy transfer. Sorry about that. Here goes a phone. Uh, we do microbiology, uh, microalgal biology and immunology, and the chemistry of stabilizing and conjugating proteins. So it makes dinner table discussions with the kids interesting each day. Um, as I said, we supply dyes, fluorescent dyes, to the flow cytometry market, conjugates to the diagnostic market, and we're um, ISO certified. And we also do some CRO work, CRO work and doing some current work on COVID-19. So we're at some... Since our fluorophores come from microalgae, a lot of people that work with them, may, you've heard of them and you used them, but you might not know where they come from. But your APCs, your PEs, your PERCPs, and your BPEs, um, which is used in Luminex, are pretty much um, commonly used in flow cytometry. So why are these dyes used? They're, the, they're really very bright fluorophores. They have high extinction coefficients, high quantum yields, they're water soluble, and you can make them into tandem dyes that make different colors. And why, what, with going into that, you know, why, why do algae make fluorescent dyes? You know, and it's really because they, they help out with photosynthesis. And uh, if you look at the absorption spectrum of chlorophyll A, you notice that in the blues and greens and yellows and oranges, the chlorophyll doesn't absorb light really well. So these algal fluorophores basically fill in that gap of the spectra so they could, they could uh, uh, help out with photosynthesis for the algae in the water. So there are really two classes of, of algal fluorophores in nature. You know, they're found in the chloroplasts and they're in proximity to reaction centers. And like, and some of them are in the cytosol and some of them are partially membrane, uh, membrane embedded. And they basically grab the photons, like I said, that, that chlorophyll can't. So we're taking blue and greens and oranges and slight reds and we're converting them to 680 into the reaction center and, and kind of helping them helping them optimize photosynthesis. So you see here on this slide, there's something here called a phycobilly zone. And that's one type of algal fluorophore. And that's made up of phycobilly proteins called APC, APC and PE, which you're all familiar with. So what the phycobilly zone does in nature is it sits on top of the reaction center photosystem two. That's the one that makes oxygen for those that don't like biochemistry. Um, and what they do is they could actually work like nature's light guide. They collect photons, 
They distribute the energy through fluorescent energy resonance transfer in an excited state. They protect the uh, chloroplast from photo damage from high intensity light. And they act like a bucket brigade where they take blue and green light and transfer it to red light. So in nature, PE actually delivers energy to APC, which delivers it to photosystem two that goes ahead and splits water and makes your oxygen. So before as a flow cytometry fluorophore is doing some more important stuff. Um, it's also the first tandem dye in nature and uh, with how it does its energy transfer, it's about 95% efficient. So um, we've yet to make a tandem dye as good, but that could tie it into flow, flow cytometry a little bit for you. Uh, these complexes could be taken out and they could be stabilized and they could be conjugated. And they're actually used as detection reagents in protein microarrays and in lateral flow point of care testing. And, and their big complexes are about 10 or 15 million kilodaltons. And they bring a lot of signal to the table and about an order of magnitude more signal than PE in a, on a binding event. So they're very bright uh, complexes. And that if you look to the right, there's a light harvesting chlorophyll protein complex. And here we're talking about your Percy peas and um, also made into the Percy P Psi 5.5 tandem. This sits in the, it in, in kind of gets into the membrane a little bit and sits against the photosystem. And basically it has a pyridinin and a chlorophyll and the pyridinin absorbs light in the blue and resonance transfers it to chlorophyll on the red, and then it splits water in nature. It's also found in photosystem one, which is the NADPH um, you know, mechanism through there. So those are the two types of fluorophores and classes that come out of algae, and um, at which you guys commonly use. So I'll go on and I'll talk a little bit about the structures of these things. And if you look at um, on the left, you'll see three donuts. And the, the one on the left is PE, the one in the middle is PC, and the one on the left at the right is um, APC. And they all look the same. And, um, and they basically have the chromophores inside of the donut, and they stack up on top of each other to form those phycobilly zones. So they basically do all their energy transfer inside the hydrophobic part of the protein and they do all their fret that way. And, uh, but they all have the same general structure. They have different molecular weights and different extinction coefficients and different brightnesses, but they're basically all built on the same, kind of the same geometry. And then if you look at Percy P, Percy P is more of a boat. So it's basically a, a protein with a, empty pocket in the middle and its cargo is the peridinin and the chlorophyll and then when they come together they do their resonance energy transfer there. So the nice thing about these are they uh, protect the chromophores. They've had about a billion years of evolution so they have very good quantum yields and the nice thing is they have a lot of functional groups we could use to conjugate to antibodies so you could use them in flow. So if we talk a little bit, tie this back into flow cytometry now that I gave some background out, you know, we noticed that spectral cytometry has come out and people are pretty excited about it. And, you know, you have the ability to do 30 different colors and that creates a need for new fluorophores. So algae have the potential to significantly increase those color options with highly sensitive water soluble fluorophores. It just gives a simple, simpler way to get some brighter fluorophores so you get better, better data at the end of the day. So we did put together two new dyes for cytometry that have come out of nature. And um, the first one's RPC. And that's a kind of combination of RPE and APC put together and has a, a, an emission uh, about 642, but it, it will excite off your green and off your red laser. And then we have a, another one we call CF5, which is a, a spectrally different phycoerythrin. 
that excites it about off your green and will emit about 614. So we have these available and they've been uh, out for testing. And if people are interested in having some antibodies conjugated, just give us a call and you could try them out. Uh, why we like them, if you put them on the brightness chart, you know, with their ex high extinction coefficients and high quantum yields, they're going to be fairly bright compared to um, some of the other dyes that are out there. So it, it just gives more choices with some, uh, you know, kind of bright fluorochromes and, and hopefully give you some better staining. So if you look at the channel fluorescence on the Aurora, you could kind of see CF5 and RPC, you know, above it is RPE. So the CF5, we, we kind of took out that a little bit, you know, attenuated that blue laser excitation and it's more focused on a red and, and, and yellow. And then RPC as a hybrid of, of exciting off, off your yellow and your red, you know. And this, this is work we did with uh, National Institutes of Health. And, um, and here's some similarity index we did, but this is a 10 color panel. We're looking for a complexity, uh, the complexity index of under 10. And, um, and you can see it, it pre has pretty good, it's closest, uh, you know, it's, it, it's closest uh, relative here is, is APC and that is 0.87, but you could get it to match in a, in a, in a, uh, in a 10 color panel. And then if you look at CF5, here's some, some spectral overlap with some other commonly used floors. We wanted to put, put that together. It's highest is with PE Dazzle at 0.85. And um, you could see the uh, other ones, you know, they're, they're kind of minim minimally crossing over. And then CF5 on the Aurora on a 10 color panel, you know, um, you know, the index is under seven. It's closest relative is, you know, overlap is, you know, 0.85 with again, PE Dazzle, but it's pretty clean with, with everything else. And then we went ahead and put these into a 33 color panel just to look at the, um, you know, just looking looking at the floor floor overlap on on a on a single uh, cell marker, and we're able to complex 33 colors up, you know, with a, 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 a and its index for uh, complexity was under 20. So now that I talked about some of the fluorophores that we have out there, I did want to talk about some new fluorophores that we have on the horizon. So one of the interesting things as I talked about earlier is that Green Valley where these dyes thrive and they're very efficient and, um, and they kind of grab light and shift it to chlorophyll A. Well, it winds up that you could start changing the conditions that some of these microalgae grow in and they will remodel their photosystems such that chlorophyll A will turn into a different type of chlorophyll which will absorb light at a different wavelength which will then cause the organism to remodel its phycobilly proteins and its PEs and its APCs to different wavelengths. So what we're working on here on some of our new dyes are, are to basically move the excitations and, and emissions around of, the, of these phycobilly proteins. So we want to keep the quantum yields high, but we want to give more options for more colors out into the IR and visible excitation to the IR. And then we're looking at soluble IR dyes that you could image through the skin. Um, and then you, again, easy to conjugate and um, and then could be used back in the flow cytometry in a number a number of different uh, panels. So uh, with that said, uh, if anybody's interested in getting these labeled, we'll be happy to label some antibodies for you. We have a custom protein labeling business it has a very responsive technical staff. It's focused on uh, quality and speed. You know, usually get an antibody back with under two weeks with whatever label you want on it. 
uh, large selection of fluorophores and, and proteins, and we do enzymes and lanthanides and all sorts of just about anything you could stick to an antibody we've done. And we've worked on reagent concept to product approval. We've worked with a number of CROs for, for a lot of their preclinical work that they have to, uh, reagents they have to build. And one thing we really do better compared to some of your you know, do-it-yourself kits is we could kind of characterize your conjugate. We could give it a size profile. If you have to go back and make it again, we can make it the same one. And uh, rather than, and, and then you don't have to do it yourself either. So um, let me go on here. We've also done some specialty conjugations of peptides, DNA, RNA, um, beads, polymers, pegs, carbohydrates. I mean, on and on, anything you could really, if there's anything unusual you need, give us, pick up the phone and give us a call. And with that, I think I've kind of went through the presentation here. So uh, thank you, thank you very much. For... Thank you so much, John. We really appreciate um, an absolutely uh, wonderful talk from you about, about some of these fluorochromes. Um, so I encourage everyone to utilize that Q&A function right at the bottom uh, if you have any questions, and I'll get started with uh, a few of my own. Um, so this is a little bit of an obscure question potentially, but um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've ever uh, heard or seen that certain fluorochromes might not be amenable to certain markers um, due to like glycosylation of, um, of certain proteins and, how, and the charge of the fluors. So um, some of these floors that you're speaking of, are you aware of any charging that might uh, impact staining on certain specific markers? You know, that, that's always a possibility when you're, when you're staining cells and sometimes you will see some interactions that are even non-specifically specific. So they do the same thing non-specifically every repeatably. Um, I mean, one of the, one of the ways to get around that is to have conjugates that are pretty well characterized that are um, not too big, that they're not, you're not throwing it, it's not just charge, it's hydrophobicity that causes trouble as well. And, uh, and then when you're using some of the smaller synthetic dyes, you know, they have some interactions sometimes that are, that are you know, where you're gonna get some non-specific staining, but most of non, most non-specific staining comes from having aggregates in your conjugate, so they're not super stable. You're, you're see interactions in a higher background. And then some of the synthetic dyes and, and um, even some of the dyes we make, you know, sometimes you're gonna get those types of interaction. Okay, great. Um, ben Daniel has a question. So um, uh, for the conjugation kits that are available, are the conjugations themselves um, based on uh, lysine or cysteine or is it site specific? They're not site specific, and and you know for these, for a labeling service, we we're generally going to work through uh, you know lysines on the product, but we could also work through uh, some of the cysteines. Um, it really depends on the protein you have, what groups are available. We could work through the glycosylation on, on a protein as well and conjugate it that way. Some people like having conjugates made that way, and um, so there's a so those are how our custom labeling services work. We we were going to make kits, and we had made kits in the past for people, but we kind of like having people send the product to us, and then we make it, and we turn it back around. It doesn't cost that much more, plus you don't have to do it yourself, plus we have a lot of expertise in doing it, and the turnaround time is fast. So, you know, people, it, it's a service. We have antibodies that come in just about every day for somebody to label and they go out all over the country not just in the flow cytometry market but the diagnostic market and and um, some other applications of people making sensors and and other things so um we're definitely you know that, that that's how we kind of set up we that's our our niche kind of our business niche okay great uh, and then uh, Joshua Croteau is asking, uh, what are the general minimal, minimum scales um, for the PB conjugates? I mean, if you want to go ahead, about a, a half a milligrams, about the minimum, when you want to do these protein-protein labelings. 
you know, we did, and, and one, one thing I bring up my salesperson is probably mad at me, but uh, listening to this, but, but we, we, we charge up to a, a fixed price up to about five milligrams. So if you send us a half a milligram or five milligrams, it costs the same amount of money. So it, it's actually, a, it's a, it's a relative bargain. If you have a lot of antibody to, to label, I, I think it costs a thousand or $1,200. It really depends. It, it's around that price. So um, I think it's one of the better bargains in life sciences. Great. Um, and then uh, Ben had a follow-up question. Um, how do you verify that the, um, the conjugations do, uh, don't mess up the um, monoclonal antibody specific binding? Uh, well, that, that's, that's really up to, up to you to find out. I mean, we could test it here if you'd like, but generally um, most, I would say with the vast majority of antibodies that we've done, you know, n about 90 to 95% of them don't, don't have a problem. Um, and if, you, if your antibody is already inherently in, unstable and you have to put arginine in it and have some type of buffer, you have to stabilize it in. You know, th th those those are the ones that generally have trouble. Bef you know, when when you conjugate them, they don't get any better when you conjugate them. But it's uh, generally speaking, um, you're not going to have an issue. Sometimes, if you're looking at very specific things like a trimethylation from a dimethylation on a histone, you'll lose some reactivity and 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 some specificity. Um, but there's there's a handful of cases I. I you know, but for the most part, it's not a problem. Okay, great. Um, so then I, I was kind of curious myself, um, when you were speaking of that, that um, brightness intensity, where you had the five, four, three, when you were listing them out, yep. um, was that on a system that had all laser lines enabled? Like, was it, uh, or was it like a, uh, a system that just had a 488 and, and 640 and 405, or was it across, did it have a oh, yellow? It's, uh, yeah, it's across a couple different lasers. Yeah, so we, it, it's across two, at least the red and red and a blue. Okay, because I was just curious because the addition of the yellow green will have a, a pretty big impact on that. So I wasn't sure um, if that if that was in, uh, one of the lasers that was. In oh, there. that that's right. It would definitely affect the brightness using whatever laser is more dominant on the absorption line of the of the fluorophore. Um, one of the things we're interested in doing is actually making some phycoerythrins that, and CF5 is a phycoerythrin, it's a little smaller uh, phycoerythrin, so it's neat in that regard. But we're also going to make a, a phycoerythrin that has a, a minimal blue and, and more green and yellow absorption. And, um, and uh, see if we could kind of put some different PEs out there so people could, when they build these panels, you give you some more floor floor flexibility. And, uh, and we're also looking at some APCs that go further out into the red. So, um, so we're going to have some neat stuff over the next, you know, come, coming up pretty soon. Okay, great. Well, flow cytometrists definitely like more options with fluorophones. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so. And, and another thing that we definitely like, and another question I had is on, you know, the stability of these fluorochromes, right? So if we start talking about uh, exposure to light and, and temperature and all of that, are there any in-house tests that you guys do to um, kind of troubleshoot this and, and get an idea of how sensitive they are to exposure to environmental conditions? Yeah, I, the nice thing, uh, the nice thing that, and talking about environmental conditions and, and when it really starts coming into play, um, with these particular dyes, when you're on the microscope, they're, they're, they, they photo bleach pretty fast. So their home is basically getting interrogated pretty quickly with a laser. Where you see a lot of the photo stability issues in cytometry is when you make these tandem dyes. And, um, and, uh, and then in certain environmental conditions, you know, certain signing dyes, oxidize off or photo oxidize very fast and you start um, losing that efficiency in transfer and then you start having light showing up where you don't want it to show up in channels you don't want it to show up in. So these are these the chromophores are well protected. They shouldn't really change much as we uh, as you use them and you know you should get a couple of years of stability. Okay. 
Wonderful, John. Thank you so much for thank a really you. good talk. And uh, we're, we're just on time, so that's perfect. And, uh, and thank you again. You're welcome. All right. Take care.